You're watching a follow-up Friday for episode 52 of the Daily Growth Discipleship Podcast. I'm Josh Havens. And I'm Chris Lambert. And we're on a journey to learn what it means to live a lifestyle of discipleship. We're glad you're joining us and hope that as you set aside this time for God, that he would help you grow today in the everyday moments of life. And this episode is going to be a particularly fun one to do a follow-up uh, conversation on because there's so much that we weren't able to really dig into in the podcast conversation. Unfortunately, we kind of limit our podcast to about an hour's worth of we try to anyway. of, of conversation. We try, yeah, exactly, to be sensitive to our guest time. Um, but man, there's been so much that's been going on in our lives behind the scenes and wrestling with these difficult issues and and just like I feel like I have like many people today and that's right now really it i've watched and read just about everything that i can get my hands on as far as like racism and how to deal with it from all different perspectives and in genres and some of them have been great some of them have been maybe not so helpful and uh so i, I just feel in a lot of ways overwhelmed i think it's really crisis overload i mean we really yeah. have we've come off of a crazy last couple of months with COVID-19. And we pretty much went straight into yep. a murder that has rocked an entire nation. Yeah, in, in the world in many cases. And I don't think our brains were meant to handle that much crisis in one shot. No, especially because you can't get away from it. Like, it's everywhere. Like, again, bo both of those things, right? Systemic racism and in COVID-19 pandemic. We're seeing it in mainstream news. You can't get on anything on social media without seeing it. And I'm glad to see that people are really standing up and taking a stand against uh, systemic racism and injustices that's been done. There's lots of good that is coming out of these conversations, but you're right. It overloads you. And it, you know, it, it harkens back to um, like many of the conversations we've had over the past couple months, and, and I especially think of the, the one we just had with Alan Fadling about resting yeah. and, and needing rest. And so, like, one of the difficulties, I'll just be honest here, with dealing with these issues of racism is it's kind of like, I'm tired. I just want to step back and take a break. But I feel incredibly guilty even trying to take a break because I know that there are my brothers and sisters and people that haven't had a break ever from this stuff. Like, and they can't. And they can't, exactly. So I feel absolutely terrible and guilty that it's like, oh, I need to take a break. And so you sort of you know, feel like you just need to keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. Um, I, I don't know if I'm going to have the right answer here. I am convinced, though, that you, if you're able to take a break, Take a break because you're going to be far more effective by getting rest and having your soul and your needs met than you are going to be from, um, you know, coming at this thing from a position of weakness. Well, that's just a fact of who we are as human beings. That's exactly. God wired us to have rest. And even in the middle of a fight, at some point, we have to take a break. Um, it, it sounds weird, but at some point we do also have to trust that God's got this whole thing under control as, as far as the big picture goes. And we can, yeah. rest, we can rest in that even in the middle of a, a battle zone. Yeah. yeah like, and, 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 and again, re recognizing that you, as much as I want to be the solution, I alone am not going to be the solution. I can work in my little area, in my little corner, and in with the people that I have some sort of influence on or, you know, that, I, that I'm talking to. But eventually I've got to pull away because most of the people that are yelling that I'm seeing on social media that's causing those that crisis just to sort of enter my brain and, you know, it, it feels like I'm interacting with more people and things than what I am because of that. It's, um, that's, not, that's not healthy. I'm not... I'm not doing anything when it comes to those people. So it's like, I need to take a break from that and step back. And I can continue my conversations that I'm having with, with uh, like family members and, and, and other friends and colleagues that we're trying to wrestle with this thing and trying to figure out how to, how to work through it. Um, another, another story, though, I, I read um, in a missionary book talking about he was feeding, you know, these starving children in, in, uh, in Africa. I forget the, the country, but... Um, he found himself skipping meals himself 
because he felt very guilty that he had food and that many of these children that they were trying to feed had very, very little. And an older missionary kind of pulled him aside and said, you know, hey, you don't need to do this. Like, I understand that that is the, that's sort of the guilt, that's the impulse setting in here. But you're not going to be able to serve these children, these people, if you are not well fed and, and strengthened as well. So although injustice is always a terrible, terrible thing to face, um, we cannot, I, I'm convinced that we cannot solve issues of injustice by doing further injustice. Not to say that skipping a meal is, is, a, is a form of injustice, but the way of Jesus has to be appri- applied, I think, in an appropriate way. And so um, if, if, for instance, this, uh, this ethic that Christ demonstrates is love, then in order for us to be able to give others love and fight for love, we have to love ourselves. We can't, we can't do this thing in a way that we're going to be um, self-denigrating ourselves. And um, I, I think there's time for self-sacrifice, but that's a little bit different. That's a different kind of a thing that we're talking about here. And so if you have the opportunity to rest, uh, take it. <laughs> I, and I'm trying to maybe preach to myself on that one because I need to. But <laughs> we're, you know, we're, we're, we're going to push forward as much as we can. That's why I love this uh, full conversation with David Swanson. It's really focused on discipleship. I mean, we think so often the solution is going to be a political one, and and there may be a political solution out there, but for the church, the solution has to start with who we are as followers of Jesus. And if that doesn't change the way that we interact with uh, people who are uh, oppressed, if that doesn't change the way that we're interacting with people who are in pain, then I don't think anything will. Yeah, no, I agree. It, 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 and again, I, what you said, for the church, that's one of the things I love about David's book is that we have to solve this problem as Christians, I think, in the church first. Now, again, that's not to say that we're not active in the world and, and we don't do, you know, we can fight, we can vote, we can do all of that sort of stuff for um, in our societies. But the church is supposed to be a witness to this new kingdom that Christ has uh, brought into the world. And that is where we as Christians believe the real solution uh, yeah, lies. And yeah. so, I- again, we can legislate non-discrimination, but there's a whole sermon where Jesus talked about it's not good enough just to not kill somebody or not to cheat on your wife. You have to become even more holy, and you have to stop thinking about those things as well. And so, for for the uh, and so that's that's been the other thing. We should talk about this, even though it's it, I think it's related. It's it's not maybe a, a direct follow up on our conversation, but it but it is. It's been on my mind over this last week. Because more and more Christians are posting these memes on social media that are things like, it's not enough just to say Jesus changes the heart and then leave it at that. And, and because really what this does is it sets up a false dichotomy in the gospel message to where we say, and I understand why it exists, which I think that is in and of itself unfortunate. It's because for so much of our Western United States Christianity, the message, the witness of the church has simply been, personal salvation. Like, I'm going to get saved, and I'm going to go to heaven. And then the way in which you follow Christ bears very, very little weight on how you live your life. It's one of the reasons why we chose the name discipleship in our, in, in our, uh, yeah. in our name is because, like, making Christians is easy, but making disciples is difficult. Dallas Willard talks about this, is that anybody can be a Christian. That's sort of like the, you know— Come into my heart, Jesus, save me, forgive me, all that sort of stuff. But to be a disciple means that there's a lifestyle change that comes about. And that's going to take your entire life to walk and figure out those sorts of things. So we, we now we're at a place where we say, no, 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 no. Jesus just changing people's hearts and, and minds isn't enough. That's not, that's not going to solve the issue. And it's like, I hear that and I'm like, wait a second, but that is the issue. Like that, if if enough people have their hearts changed, then racism goes away. Like those are that's my thought process to this. I understand what the other people though are getting at when they say 
no, you have to do something. But, but again, any true belief, if you really believe it, we didn't even get into the conversation um, with David, but the whole f- like first chapter of David's book is talking about the process of how a disciple changes. And, he, and he's drawing on James K. Smith's work from You Are What You Love, whereas we are desiring beings and the things that we desire are the things that we follow and, and we put our actions into those things. And so if we really do believe that the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ is salvation, it's freedom, it's reconciliation between God and us, no matter what your, your race, your, your skin color, ethnicity, gender, all of that sort of stuff, those things disappear because in Christ we are one, then that message can't help but change the way you live your life. And that's going to, that's, again, in that case then, the law may be unjust in some cases, but within the church, now the church becomes the haven. And that's where, that's where David's message really struck me and, and where I have been torn apart over the past few weeks learning more about the church's uh, complicity with racism and how it's been, because it, it mars our witness. Now we as the church are basically left, you know, sitting here kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, we look very bad to the world because the world is pointing out things that should have been part of our essential message from the beginning. Like incarnating, which is a word that we used in the, uh, the episode, and being willing to be like Jesus, go into the mess and be in the mess and just hurt with someone. Yes. And we're very willing to, un- unwilling to do that outside of the church, mm-hmm. which... And people point out, and honestly, that's one of the reasons, uh, like the LGBTQ community is so tightly knit among themselves is because people have found a place of belonging and an acceptance there. And I'm not saying that a homosexual lifestyle or, or anything like that is, uh, not a sin. That's not the point. The point is Jesus came down and he was willing to associate with tax collectors and prostitutes. And if you look at the way Jesus interacted with them in the Gospels, it wasn't about, hey, you guys all need to change your lifestyles. What you're, what you're doing is, is sinful. You need to change and come follow me. No, it was really just follow me. And as they did those things, they began to change mm-hmm. just because they were spending time with the person who was showing them what love actually looked like. Yeah. And that's not, that's not something that the church in America has done well in the last couple hundred years. No, we haven't. We've done, yeah, we've done a terrible job of it. Again, and I think it goes back to this idea that we have made salvation very personal. And again, it is, it is a personal thing. It's something that takes place between you and Christ, but it's communal. By accepting this call to follow Christ, you have joined a community, which is why we've made it our step three, because walking, walk with someone. Yeah, walking in community is an integral part of what, it's not like Jesus and Peter, <laughs> you know, come follow me, and I guess your brother can come too, since he's there, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was a community, and, and, and these disciples, we see them all through the Gospels having to try to figure out how to work to, with each other. They're, they're bumping up against one another, and they're constantly fighting about who's going to be the greatest in the, in the Their kingdom. Their moms are even getting in the fight. Yeah, exactly. Which is, <laughs> anyway, that's hilarious to me too, but just to imagine. But, um, but again, that is the messy process that we have to work through. And um, like, again, we're going to fail. Like, we just are. We're going to fail. The church is going to fail at this. What's important, I think, is not that we are perfect, but that we're willing to call out our failures when we fail. Again, it seems, it seems counterintuitive that the church would be bad at this because that's our primary message is that we, we're preaching forgiveness of sins, and, and in order to get that forgiveness, you have to what? Believe that you've done something wrong and confess it. But we are terrible at doing that as a church because we, we kind of want to stand back and say, no, 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 we are perfect. Well, I mean, we do it in the church, though, right? It's We're like terrible at doing that after, that after yeah. <laughs> salvation. It's kind of like, okay, I'm going to be perfect now. Yes. And uh, <laughs> if I messed up, I'll ju- we'll, just, we'll just keep that under wraps and 
I gotta make sure that everybody still understands that I've been washed in the blood and there's grace and yes, I'm covered and I haven't done anything wrong since. Exactly. Which so, none of us would actually admit, like that's what we actually believe, but that's how we behave. That, that's a oh, great point. Great point. That's exactly how we behave. And so, like, as as I wrestle with this, like, what is my role in fighting against racism, uh, particularly in the church? Like, wh- and what's the church's role? Like, I have never been involved with. Um, I, I've never been in an active role uh, of trying to promote systemic racism in any way, shape, or I've never signed legislation. I've never said, you know, no, that kind of a person can't come. Like, n- none of those sorts of things. So on the one hand, I'm not guilty of that kind of racism. On the other hand, I'm part of a body that is. So how do I go about apologizing or repenting of, the, uh, of this uh, sin? Okay, number one, an apology is just simply being sorry for something. So I think real repentance is needed here. Repentance really means to turn. Like if you do a Hebrew word study, I'm not going to go into all that sort of stuff. It means to turn. Like you're going in one direction and you repent. You literally turn from that way. And so repentance isn't just, hey, I'm sorry that that happened. It's it's a literal change that has to take place. Now, I also feel very strongly that you cannot repent of something that you have not actually committed because, again, there's nothing to turn from in, in, in that sense. But as a body, as a church, I believe we do have a duty to call out our past injustices. Even though we may not have been the people that's doing that, we represent Jesus Christ, his body in this case, and then all of these different atrocities and, and things in the past. I mean, we can go all the way back to right like there. Um, like the Crusades and stuff like that, like the name of God has been used in very sacrilegious, awful, the exact opposite of what Christ came to 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 preach to us uh, ways. Those things we should have no fear of renouncing, immediately renouncing those things, repenting of them. That yes, the people in the name of Christ have have done evil things. Let's repent of it. And let's turn. Let's, let's do something different. And I think that's really where the conversation needs to be had in the church is how do we go about repenting and how do we go about turning? What, what, is, what are we going to do as a church body? And that's a very difficult conversation to take place because um, I think it does have to start in our local churches. And that's why I think David's book is, is a phenomenal in that case because he gives us many practices in his book that can help us as a local church begin to implement new discipleship practices that can bring about true solidarity yeah those those are great starting places honestly the the one that we did talk about in the in the podcast episode the eucharist just the the lord's supper whatever you want to call it um it's it's meant to be a communal practice and if you look back in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, when Paul's telling the, the Corinthians, you need to examine yourself, he's talking about the, the, uh, the problem that some of the believers were coming in and, say, and hogging all of the food, not mm-hmm. being generous, not sharing the food and drink in the communal meal, and some people were going away hungry. Mm-hmm. And it was causing tension and division between people in the, in the body of Christ there. And so Paul says, you need to check yourself and make sure that you're not eating of this meal in an unworthy manner, because everything that it represents is community. And if you do something that is against the community in this communal meal, you are destroying what Christ has established in this. And so if we take that and apply it to uh, an issue like, let's say we've got a white church and a black church caused by the whites not being willing to associate with the blacks a long time ago, um, practicing something like communion, which is in its very essence unity in the Mm -hmm. body of Christ, is a great way to get get started actually moving toward that heart change, that that mind change, that turn, that repentance. Yeah. And, and, And it's, again, because very few people in that white church, I think, will have overtly racist tendencies now some might we some and some might we all have to deal with our own prejudices that that we don't really know are there and again i've had to do lots of work after reading david's book to to, to recognize some of those within me um again like 
like one of the things I realized, I don't want to go too long with this video, but one of the things I realized was um, like the individualism that he pointed out or, or just this idea of whiteness in general. When he describes what whiteness is, everybody coming from Germany and Ireland and Sweden and Britain and stuff like that, and then they, they get rid of those cultural heritage, those ethnic heritage identities just to become white, I would say, no, 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 no. That's what it means to be an American. And then I realized, like, it hit me. It was like, oh, what I'm saying as an American identity, because that's how I was raised— is what my black brothers and sisters are saying is whiteness. And it was, it's no wonder they feel excluded. Because I'm saying, no, no, no. Join the American you know, identity and you can enjoy all of these sorts of things. And again, some of that's me, but I think that's, the, that, those, that's yeah. the big narrative that's out there. And they're saying, no, 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 that's what it means to be white. And I'm like, but white's a color, black's a color, but it's that identity issue that they're really harping against. And then, again, so it makes so much more sense to me now as to why somebody like Donald Trump can uh, you know, go and campaign for Make American Great Again and all that sort of stuff. And me as a white person, I see nothing wrong with that other than, I mean, I do agree, when was America great? But I can also <laughs> kind of see the red, like, Anyway, but that was before. But now I can really understand it. It makes so much more sense to me because, again, Americanness, whiteness in that case, has been very oppressive to them in ways that I've never noticed before. So I, I think, okay, so back to the white and black church <laughs> example. <laughs> so lots of those white people either aren't overtly racist or, or have very subtle tendencies that they don't know about. This continued interaction with, again, a practice like communion or U the Eucharist, which both churches will agree in. So it's very non, it, it, it's, it's low cost just to do this with each other, begins to awaken our deep-seated tendencies and thoughts, and, and the Holy Spirit can come in and start to work on us in ways that we didn't know we needed to have him work in our lives. And so, and that's what you're talking about. When Jesus says, come and follow me, just do it. Just come and follow me. And then the Spirit is going to work in, our, in your life, in our lives, through this simple obedience in the same direction. Or long obedience in the same long direction. Long obedience in the same direction. But simple. It can be simple, too. That is going to be the way in which Christ transforms our lives ultimately. And I, and, and I think for the church, that has to be where our hope is for solving this racial division amongst us. because. I, I, I just, for logistic reasons, I, I don't think we're going to dissolve the white and black churches. As much as I would love for that to happen, it's just, you know, they're, they're, they're corporations now, and it's like all this other stuff that, that's so much more involved. But man, I would love to see the day when we don't have to refer to things like as white and black or multi-ethnic, multi-racial churches, because that's what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be all nationalities, all races, all creeds, all gathered together worshiping God in proclamation for the God that is the God of the entire world. And so we've got to struggle until we get there. And, and, and I think uh, David was right, and uh, the answer has to be discipleship. How are we following Christ in this world to demonstrate his love, his goodness, and his way to those around us you guys thank you so much for watching and definitely go pick up a copy of david swanson's book rediscipling the white church link in the description and if you haven't watched or listened to the full episode with david swanson you need to go check that out it's a really really great conversation we didn't get into nearly everything that's in the book but if you're curious about what's in the book this will give you a good primer on that and so Definitely go check out both of those, The Conversation and the book Rediscipling the White Church.